Hi, my name is Mattia Murray, and welcome to The Longer Road. You are on The Longer Road if you have multiple intersectional identities that are often marginalized. You've had to work harder to get to the starting line, and you might feel behind. I'm here to provide hope, support, and practical tips, and to let you know that you're not alone. Welcome. I wanted to give an identity update about myself as sort of a reintroduction to me, Mattia, because there are a few things that have shifted and changed since I started the podcast a bit over a year ago. And a couple of them in particular, I think might be useful for people to hear about. Some of them I have already touched on in episodes or mentioned, but haven't really gone into big detail. So one that feels interesting and meaningful for me around gender is I still identify as non-binary. I still identify as medically transitioning in that I am on testosterone. And I'm open about that. I'm happy to talk about that. The thing that has shifted is that for the first time recently-ish, like within the last year, I have started being gendered male in public more. And as a non-binary person, my personal goal is not to pass because I am not transitioning to male. I am transitioning to less gender is sort of my goal. I have I don't feel like I have a lot of gender myself. I don't feel like I have a lot of masculinity or femininity. And I have achieved my own goals, basically, for what I want, um, for my body and presentation very happy with my voice, etc. Although my voice will still probably continue to come down a little bit. It's much lower than it used to be. But the identity part of that, the way that other people interface with it, is that it really is making me reckon again with masculinity in a way that I haven't really since I started coming out as genderqueer in 2015 and started, you know, visibly being out everywhere in like 2016 and really starting to transition So it's actually been a while since I've really thought about masculinity, but having strangers in public refer to me as he, even after hearing my voice sometimes, which never used to happen, it's a really interesting experience. And I'm still in my own journey very much so around how I feel about masculinity. I would probably be upset if people always gendered me male. This is a really interesting space, though, because it also makes me feel a lot more comfortable presenting as femme because people aren't always automatically gendering me as a woman in public. So it's kind of complicated still in my own head, as a lot of people's genders are who've, you know, taken their own gender journey. And one of the things that really stood out to me is I've had three cis people in the last year or so ask me if I was, when I said I was trans, they asked me if I was assigned male at birth. So they knew enough about transness to know what that was. And literally that was one of my transition goals, I guess, was to basically, I like being visibly trans, but I don't want people to automatically gender me in one direction all the time. So anyway, that's just one update is, you know, I'm very happy with where my gender is and it's also causing me to kind of think about masculinity again in a way I haven't in years. Another update is I do now have an Ehlers-Danlos diagnosis in my medical chart. And the reason I'm putting it that way is because I have not done official genetic testing around it. I've had a hyper, like non-specific hypermobility disorder in my chart forever. But this was my doctor looking at a couple more factors that she could look at and see and was like, oh yeah, okay, here, you know, I'm going to go ahead and put this in here. So it's something I've suspected for a long time. It's, I have to be very, very careful with my joints and body. So it's something I've been assuming I had for a long time. And also, I don't know, there's such a weird thing around official diagnosis. So in theory, I can get additional medical support around it. And at the same time, not having it be a hundred percent confirmed, it's still my doctor's opinion, which is again, useful, but this is, I don't know. I I think about this a lot in the context of my autism diagnosis as well. I trust it. I know that I have it. I had self-diagnosed first and there is something 
nice about a medical professional giving you that extra little stamp so that you can get the insurance coverage for whatever you might need around it. And at the same time, I still don't feel like a hundred percent attached to the diagnosis because I was still the one leading the conversation. My doctor did actually look at a couple of factors that I didn't know about. So, I mean, she is very good and I trust her. And because I've had to self-advocate for myself so hard in medical settings, and I often come in with at least an idea about what I think is going on, or at least like a very clear picture of symptoms that I've been, you know, tracking and again, advocating for myself repeatedly. When I do have a doctor who is taking me seriously, looking at everything I've gathered and, you know, using terms that make sense to me and actually listening to me, it's almost kind of hard to accept in certain ways because I'm so accustomed to having doctors be dismissive about my own research or self-knowledge, which again, I know is a very common experience. So this is another kind of interesting one where I'm happy to have it on the medical chart. It's useful. I have learned some new things. Um, For example, a couple of years ago, I did Invisalign because I was told that it would help my jaw and TMJ and potentially help migraines, which it may well have because that is something that has decreased very significantly. When I did Invisalign, it went super, super quickly. Like the orthodontist commented on how unusually quickly it was going. And apparently that's really common with Ehlers-Danlos because everything's squishy and your bones can just move faster. So anyway, I have learned some new things around it since the diagnosis and it's useful. I think it's useful, but it is an identity update because up until that officially, I knew that I had a physical disability, but it didn't really have a name besides just genetic hypermobility disorder, I think was what was in my chart. And I didn't really have necessarily an easy avenue to talk about it in language that was really, really clear to other people besides just listing all of my own personal issues and symptoms. So there is something nice about having a label. Another one that I want to talk about again, that I know I've touched on in different points in the podcast, but just want to really clearly talk about it in one place, is this connection between complex PTSD and ADHD. So I've had two rounds of neuropsych testing, and the first one was deeply disappointing because it basically started with the tester, who I think was also technically a grad student because I was in Boston, basically starting with, well, you know you have an extraordinary mind. And I was just like, oh no, (laughs) he's not going to be helpful. And I think I've talked about that before a bit on the podcast, just what that experience was like. But basically in the two rounds of neuropsych testing, I got the autism diagnosis with the second one. Both of the neuropsych testing rounds said, yes, you have a lot of ADHD symptoms, but it's not a hundred percent clear that it is obviously biological in nature, meaning that it's just this specific inborn trait that you've had forever. They said basically, you know, it's impossible to tell because there's so much overlap between complex PTSD and ADHD. It's impossible to tell how much of this is from the childhood abuse and how much of it is, you know, a biological. Again, I don't love disorder. I still, I think of ADHD as a neurotype as well. And at the same time, you know, It can be disabling in the culture that we're in because we don't have what we need. And I know I talked about this a couple times before, but what I wanted to share as the update is basically when CPTSD and ADHD are like they are in my brain, in my past, where a professional looks at the data and says, well, could go either way. You know, I don't want to put it, they basically don't want to medicate me. So they don't want me to have the ADHD label, which is okay with me at this time in my life. And what they basically said was, you know, keep going to therapy, keep working on your PTSD. When I had the first round of neuropsych testing, um, I don't know, six years ago. And they said, basically, if the ADHD symptoms get better as your CPTSD is improving, then it turns out in retrospect, it wasn't ADHD. And yes, this is unfortunately a diagnostic practice or or sort of standard, I should say, 
because these two things are so similar in the brain. And just in case you don't know, complex PTSD is from prolonged trauma as a child. And again, that's not necessarily what everybody would automatically look at and call trauma. Neglect absolutely counts. And it doesn't have to be violent or physical. It's just anything that was too much for that child's nervous system at the time. And sensitive and neurodivergent children may find more things traumatizing because their system gets overloaded. So that's another thing I want to point out is that you can have complex PTSD symptoms even if your childhood, quote, wasn't that bad because you as a child, it was too much for your nervous system and this is how it landed. And then the other kind of key component for one reason it can turn into PTSD symptoms, because it doesn't always, right? There are people who experience trauma and it doesn't turn into PTSD. One of the main protective factors is having at least one stable adult who you trust and is basically either telling you this is not okay or giving you additional support. That can be very, very protective. There's a whole bunch of factors around it. I would definitely look up complex PTSD if you don't know what it is, just because it's very common and it can be something that causes people to get emotionally triggered when they don't know what it is yet. So I know a lot of people who have learned about complex PTSD from me talking about it. And I think it's very common, at least, again, in the bubble I'm in, because a lot of the people I know have other marginalized identities. So where I was going with this is my PTSD is so much better. It's hard to even describe how much better I feel consistently, how much safer I feel. And I definitely still have a lot of ADHD symptoms. And this is something that I wanted to share because, again, it was one of those things where that weird interface between my lived experience and the medical side of it, the medical side of my experience, made me question myself because some of these things, you know, that first neuropsych tester saying, well, just kind of wait and see and keep doing therapy, etc. And one of the big factors in recognizing how impactful ADHD symptoms are in my life has been living with a partner who has like pretty amazing executive function and can just do things. And it's like incredible to watch. And their capacity to do things in certain ways is much, much higher than mine around specific types of things. And having them take the lead on stuff that's hard for me. And then when they had their accident five months ago, four months ago, uh, when they were in a severe accident and were hospitalized and I was doing all of the caretaking for a bit, I was like, oh, wow. I had kind of forgotten how hard some of these specific tasks were for my brain and my body in some cases because of the wibbly wobbly joints, but especially my brain and especially the ordering of tasks, figuring out what the steps are, putting them in order, and then actually doing them in order without freaking out. Like that whole thing is so hard for me in some contexts, in a lot of contexts. And I don't know, it's been kind of validating to realize, okay, my PTSD is so, so, so much better to the point that it's dropped off of my psych chart, not CPTSD, but just like my present PTSD symptoms are not diagnostically significant at the moment, which is amazing. And to go, okay, well, that thing happened. I kept doing the work and the therapy and all that, and I feel much safer, much better. And ADHD still feels like a very reasonable diagnosis for my lived experience. Not to mention, I think three of my siblings have gotten an ADHD diagnosis within the last year. So, I mean, it's, you know, it's in the family. And to be fair, this may not feel like an update to you if you know me because I do talk about ADHD, but if you know me well, you may have noticed that I've been talking about autism a lot more in the last couple of years. And it was partly because that was a newer realization for me. Like I realized that later than I realized that I probably had ADHD, but it was also because of what I was just describing about that lived experience versus the medicalized experience and not wanting to take up space or 
you know, claim an identity that I like wasn't a hundred percent sure about. And in terms of identity, it's so complicated, I think for people, and it may well be for you with certain things, I think around queerness, around disability, around neurodivergence, it can be really hard to self-identify and then also feel comfortable stepping into spaces and taking up space in that space, asking for help and building community because of this medicalized model that says there's a correct way to be that, you know, a diagnosis is the most official or whatever. And yeah, I just wanted to share again, kind of where I'm at in that journey, because I hope it's useful to hear. And again, if you know me, I feel like certainly if you've lived with me or have, you know, lived near me, it is so obvious that I have all these ADHD traits. It's so obvious when you see my whole family, when you see all of us interact, both my parents have ADHD, like it, you know, it's, it's real. And at the same time, I just want to share that, like, I've still been in this process myself mentally of fully accepting and being comfortable with the way that I talk about it, because I really care about being accurate as well. It's just an important value to me as being honest and transparent. So I hope that's useful to hear. Another personal update is that I've been feeling a lot more comfortable with my own personal spiritual experience. I've been sharing it more, talking about it more, and that's been really lovely, honestly, to be able to do that. And one of the things that that's led to is I've really, I use intuition a lot in my work, very significantly, uh, whether it's, you know, figuring out who to talk to, what kinds of offers to make, like intuition is a really big part of what I do. It's a big part of when I'm deciding who I want to work with, you know, if, if a client approaches me the way that I figure out if it's a good fit or not, I use intuition so, so, so heavily. And part of that is related to my own internal again, for the most part of my life, very private spiritual practices. Since I moved away from evangelical Christianity, the spiritual practices that I've developed for myself that actually feel good, I just, I felt so weird and icky about talking about it because being evangelical before, literally the point of it is to preach and tell everyone. And I was fucking annoying about it as a teenager. So It's been really nice to just integrate my own spirituality. And for me, a lot of that is just about connection and openness. It's very abstract and large, but I do, again, have my own practices. And I will talk about this more later at some point, but I just want to mention I am going to be co-leading a month-long course container thing with my friend Roberta Smart, who is in the UK. She is incredibly magical. She's been on the podcast. She's given me amazing readings. She's deeply, deeply intuitive. And we're going to be doing this month long program around the spring equinox called Three Keys to Lazy Magic. And if you're interested in that, I'm just going to pop the link in the show notes. Again, I'll talk about it more later, but I'm very, very excited to be sharing this part of myself a bit more publicly because. I think in my head, it's been very separate from the type of work I'm doing, even though my own intuition and spirituality and magical practices are deeply core to how I function and what I'm creating, and especially for my creative side. So I'm excited to be sharing that. And then the last, well, it's not little, but the last update is if you listen to the very first episode of this podcast where I talk about my childhood a bit, I'd never go into big details or triggering details. That's a goal of mine when I talk about my own trauma is to not give triggering details because there's actually very few trauma resources out there, books and so forth, that give advice and help without also giving really, really triggering stories. So I really try not to do that. And so without saying anything in particular, and just knowing that I had a very difficult and abusive childhood that was both actively abusive and also neglectful at the same time. So really just a fun smorgasbord there. Something that I've been processing, I knew my dad was autistic. It's like very, very obvious that my dad is autistic. I can't imagine that anybody would disagree with me who knows him. And 
I don't think he knows that. <laughs> I have not talked to him about it. I haven't talked to my dad in nine years. So we're not in contact. And one thing, he just turned 60 a few months ago. And one thing I was thinking of doing was basically writing him a letter, just being like, hey, you're autistic. And also here was my experience being an autistic, being your autistic child. And I didn't write that letter because I didn't feel ready to do so. I'm at the point right now where I'm actually considering writing it as sort of an open letter and then sending it to him because part of what I want to write about is some of the things that came up for me as a child and that I've realized since then. And also one of the things I realized around it is I have so much compassion for my parents and to a large degree, I feel like I've forgiven them for most of the things that were directly about me. It is harder for me to forgive them around continued abuse they did to my youngest siblings after we told them how horrible it was. And they actually got worse at that point when I was an adult. So it's hard for me to say I've forgiven them completely because that stuff is still there in my heart. But the kind of update, I guess, is I have this really weird experience where I have no interest in a relationship with my dad, neither of my parents, honestly, but I have no interest in a relationship. And at the same time, I have this huge amount of compassion for how miserable my dad is as a 60 year old autistic man who may also be queer for all I know. Cause you know, you don't have that many queer kids without one of you being queer. I think the six of the seven of us are out and yeah, I don't know. I'm in this interesting place where I don't feel the need to kind of do any additional relationship building or forgiveness work with my parents. And I feel like I could write and send this letter if I wanted to, and I would feel good about it. And that's a really, really nice place to be because even with going no contact, taking space, you know, making all this space in my own brain, getting all the support and help, obviously doing a ton of therapy and a lot of somatic modalities to like process really young stuff that I know happened. Like, for example, I know that the first time my dad hit my mom was when she was pregnant with me, I think, or maybe, well, maybe it was right before that, but it was like, right, it was like right around the time when she got pregnant with me. And so I know that from the very earliest germination of my physical existence, violence has been a part of it. And it's so weird to be in this place where because I'm doing so well and like feeling so healthy and because I'm so happy in my day-to-day -day life, I feel like I could reach out and try to be helpful in a way. Again, I don't know how my dad will receive this and I don't know how I'm going to create and deliver the letter. I'm still, I'm just letting that be a slow process for me. I'm not trying to make myself do anything. And it feels really nice to be in a place where I feel like I could give something back to my parents emotionally and it would genuinely feel like a gift and that I wouldn't need anything back, that I wouldn't want anything back. And it feels like a really, really deep level of healing. And also for me, writing this letter is partly about me further processing and kind of like putting some pieces together of some things that happened when I was a kid. So again, like as an identity thing, this is just to say you've probably, again, if you know me or things I've said on the podcast, You've probably heard me be very dismissive of my parents, you know, the idea of a relationship with them. I still don't want one. <laughs> and at the same time, I am feeling like I would be okay if I needed to do that. If it happened, you know, for example, if I saw my parents at a family event, I feel like I would actually be fine. And I would be very kind to myself if I wasn't. It would be okay if I wasn't okay if I saw them. So that's it for the updates. I just wanted to share where I'm at right now. There probably are other little things that I know have shifted and that I was thinking about talking about. And I decided to focus on these kind of big buckets that feel really, really important around gender, the Elder Stanlos, and my ADHD and my dad. The, the All of these things are just kind of present together in a certain way because actually one of the things that I want to put in the letter, even though my dad wasn't as directly involved in this, is I was having symptoms of Ehlers-Danlos as a small child. And I was talking about them and I was complaining about them and I could not get my parents to take me seriously. So all of these things I feel like 
developing simultaneously. I also was like very visibly queer and like talked about being trans as well as a young age without any language to really describe my experience. I was just trying to describe it. So all of these things actually kind of fit together. And I have found that when a lot of identity pieces feel connected like that for me, something along the lines of writing this letter to my dad, again, even if I never send it, but helping me kind of put the pieces together in my own head and feel like I have a better picture. It's kind of like storytelling. And I think there are a lot of opportunities to retell our stories in ways that are more supportive of who we are now. That's a whole other episode. Uh, I could definitely go more into that. And I think I've talked about it a bit, you know, here and there. I really think about a lot the way that I describe myself, the way I tell my story, and the way that it interfaces with my current identities. So when my identities are shifting or have shifted, it's really important to me to reflect back and retell maybe some portion of my story based on that. For example, obviously, when I realized I was autistic, it rewrote large swaths of my childhood. It didn't change the facts, I was just seeing them differently. So I do think there's this opportunity that I have right now to take these developing or shifting or consolidating identities and look back and just reflect on what it means for me now and how it feels good to describe myself now. Because I don't want to trauma bond with everybody. I don't do that anymore. That was kind of, you know, a useful time in my life to be able to be close with other traumatized people who were really actively in their own healing processes. It was really helpful to talk about a lot. And these days, that's not how I primarily connect with people. Although I still do tend to gravitate toward people with weird backgrounds in a variety of ways because we just get each other. So yeah, I hope something in here was useful to you and or that it gets you thinking about what's your current identity? How do those pieces fit together if they do in any way or not? How, you know, how are those individual pieces of identity meaningful to you? And then how do you describe yourself right now? And what does it mean to you to kind of look at your identity as a whole in the context of how you've been describing yourself? Because when my identity shifts, the way I talk about myself inevitably changes eventually, but I like to do it a little bit more proactively because it just feels more coherent to me to be describing myself as I see myself now and not as a snapshot of myself from six months or a year or a year and a half ago or you know even longer in some cases. I hope you have a great week and I'll talk to you next week. Thanks for listening. If you know someone who would be helped by this podcast, please share it with them. And I'd love to hear your thoughts and suggestions at Mattia at MattiaMarie.com. That's M-A-T-T-I-A at M-A-T-T-I-A-M-A-U-R-E-E dot com. Thank you.